Hey techies, welcome back. Today, we're gonna to be talking about five great plot twists that you can use in your mystery novels. I'm Jane, and this is Fiction Technician. All right, how can I give you plot twists for your books? Aren't plot twists supposed to be incredibly surprising, original inventions? Well, little yes, little no. Um, yes, when we deploy a plot twist, we definitely want to give the reader a big surprise. But the fact is that a plot twist is nothing more than something the reader believes that turns out to be false. And so we're going to be looking at five great classic mystery plot twists. We're going to be looking at kind of the broadest form of the twist. What is the reader belief that was controverted? And we're going to be talking about variations on the twist and ways that you can use them in your books in original ways that are right for your story. And because I don't want to spoil any new mysteries that are out there for you, we're going to be using some of my old classic favorite TV shows, which are Remington Steele and Monk. So see if you can spot the plot twist in this first story. Laura Holt and Remington Steele of the Steele Detective Agency are summoned to the home of Charles Wellington, an oil tycoon of almost unlimited wealth. They assume they've been hired by the Wellingtons, but it turns out that the servants pooled their money to hire the agency. You see, their butler, Hastings, was just killed and they are sure one of the Wellingtons must have murdered him. You see, Hastings was eagerly anticipating the publication of his memoirs, a sordid look at his decades of service to the Wellingtons. And surely one of them must have done him in because they all have secrets that they want to keep under wraps. When all is said and done, which of them is it? None. It's actually the gardener, Kiramatsu. So this is a twist that I like to call the butler did it. I'm not talking about a literal butler here, of course, or a servant. What I'm talking about is a twist in a mystery novel where it seems like the killer must come from group A, they actually come from group B. There are a million ways to work this twist. Um, maybe the crime was quite brutal and we assume that the killer must be male, but the killer turns out to be female. Maybe she used some sort of weapon to enhance her strength. Or maybe you're writing a mystery set in a mental hospital and the crime was very chaotic and impulsive and so we assume that it must be one of the inmates. It actually turns out to be a nurse. So the reader belief that we have controverted here is that the killer is from group A and you can split up these groups any way you want. Gender, age, philosophy. Anytime it seems logical that the killer came from group A, but they don't, we're going to take it as a big surprise. This plot also employs a twist I like to call the not so obvious motive. You'll recall that when Laura and Steele began investigating, they were sure that the murder had something to do with Hastings memoirs. This is our grand obvious motive and it gives us a clear direction for the investigation and a nice salacious clue to search for the memoirs themselves. But they weren't the motive at all. It turns out that Kiramatsu killed Hastings in order to gain possession of a large number of stock certificates that Hastings had extorted from the Wellingtons over years and years. This is a nice new motive that makes sense with what we know about Hastings. The kind of guy who would write a tell-all about his bosses is probably also the kind of guy who wouldn't mind blackmailing them. But because it's new, it comes as a surprise. And the reader belief that we're controverting here is that the motive is the one we established when the story began. The not so obvious motive twist pairs very well with the Butler did it twist because there are a lot of stories where it is logical for every member of a group to share the same motive. But you can use this twist independently anytime you've got a victim who maybe has a deep dark secret for which a lot of people hate them or a event coming up in their future that a lot of people want to prevent. Say the changing of a will or as in this case, the revelation of secrets. You take the obvious motive, you make it big and grand and, and clear and you give us a lot of suspects to whom it might apply and then you zing us at the end by giving us something different. The next twist I wanna talk about is one I call Casualty of War. In the episode Steel Eligible, Remington Steel is chosen by a magazine to be on its list of five most eligible bachelors in LA. This is great PR for the agency. The only problem is that bachelors keep dying. Laura and Remington investigate and eventually learn that only one of the bachelors is the killer's true target. So the reader belief that we have controverted here is that the first victim 
is the primary victim. Usually that's how mystery novels play out, but it can be a really great twist when the first victim is not the primary victim or perhaps not even the intended victim at all. This sort of mystery where several victims are killed in order to occlude the killer's true motive is known as an ABC mystery, and I'll just let them explain it to you. It's an Agatha Christie novel in which A wants to kill C, but kills B first to divert suspicion. Because he has no motive to kill B. Precisely. The police attempt to connect the two deaths. And A gets away with murder. But there are lots of other ways to work this twist, like perhaps a mistaken identity plot where the villain gets the wrong victim right out of the gate and has to correct as he goes along. Twist number four is called the perfect alibi. So in order to talk properly about the perfect alibi, we first really have to discuss a sort of subset of mysteries that we might call how done it. In these mysteries, we know who done it and why very early on, and the joy in this mystery is figuring out exactly how they committed the crime. This subset includes locked room murders, perfect alibis, and nearly every episode of Muck. One of my absolute favorites comes from an episode called Mr. Monk and the Astronaut. In this episode, Mr. Monk is certain that a famous astronaut killed his ex-girlfriend. Only problem? He wasn't on the planet when she died. The coroner is convinced that she died on Wednesday. The astronaut was in orbit from Monday to Friday. Guy in this, pretty good alibi. Monk eventually realizes that the astronaut incapacitated his girlfriend by drugging her and then constructed a murder machine out of garage door parts that would throttle her while he was in orbit. So the reader belief that we have controverted here is that the murderer must be present at the time of the murder. There are other reader beliefs though that you can controvert to get an amazing perfect alibi story. Frequently people will controvert the belief that the murder happened at the time we believed, perhaps by changing clocks so that it appears that the murder happened later, or altering the temperature of the body so that forensic experts will deduce that the murder happened earlier. If you like to watch old episodes of Monk, and I do, uh, you're going to see a lot of perfect alibi stories, so let me know if you want me to put together a video specifically on the perfect alibi twist, because there are many, many great variations. If you feel like this whole video is making sense and giving you some interesting ideas about how to put mystery plots together, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't because I have lots of great content on cozy mysteries coming up over the next several weeks. Our last twist is called The Tangled Web, and for this one we're going back to Remington Steele. In this episode, Laura and Steele are hired to find the missing funds that were embezzled from the treasury of a guild of mystery writers. As they investigate, they learn that the funds were willed to the Mystery Guild by a member who recently passed away, and the funds were given to the Guild with the specific provision that they be used to tear down the Guild's headquarters and build a new one. They begin to suspect that one of the Mystery Writers killed somebody long ago, and that person is terrified that if the headquarters are demolished, their secret will come out. They gather the writers and play a tape with various demolition sounds, hoping they can spook the guilty party into believing that his or her secret is about to be revealed. Have you no shame? Have you no scruples? Deep, dark secrets are meant to be deep and dark. Good Lord, there is a body. When will you learn to trust me, Laura? In this case, the reader belief that we have controverted is that the crime that began this story is the primary crime. That's not the case. The primary crime actually happened years ago, and the crime that set this story into motion is just another crime that's been layered on to try and cover up that earlier crime. Thinking about what went wrong for the villain of your mystery novel is always a great question to ask yourself when you begin plotting. Something has to go wrong for them, or else they wouldn't get caught and we wouldn't have much of a book. And thinking about what those things are is a great way to generate clues, plot points, and twists. Often what went wrong will involve perhaps losing control of a key piece of evidence such as the murder weapon or having somebody else find out about your crime as in this case. 
Mystery readers just love twists and thinking about the reader beliefs that are sort of inherent to the mystery genre or those reader beliefs that you can encourage us to take on based on the way you set up your story is a great way to provide twists that are organic to your story, fun, and wonderfully surprising. Tech out!